message from the team at the arcade fire you can make it if you don't quit that uh got me fired up this morning so um i think that's a good theme for what we're talking about here today and all of our conversations in the good hour it's about helping you the entrepreneur the startup founder uh navigate this challenging world of the legal risks and issues and and challenges that arise in your business approaching them with confidence and some of the education that we're sharing with you here today. You can develop strategies to overcome those and ultimately uh, be more successful with your business. So as always, some ground rules. Um, we want these webinars, these good hour sessions to feel like a conversation and a dialogue. And the only way in this virtual context that we can facilitate discussion, conversation, address your questions, pardon me, is through the chat function. So we've got two tabs on your Zoom browser. You've got the chat function. That's where um, our fantastic producer, Katie, and our legal concierge team are hanging out so they can answer good lawyer related questions um, for your legal questions, substantive stuff that you want myself or my co-host Pauline to address. Use the Q&A channel for that. I will monitor the Q&A tab closely I will not be looking at the chat function as closely. So uh, if it's in the chat, I might miss it. If it's in the Q&A, Pauline and I will certainly address your question. Um, last piece here, disclaimer. Really what we're sharing with you today is some legal information and uh, you know educational type content. If you need specialized nuanced legal advice for your specific business, uh, you know the best place to go, goodlawyer.ca. Any one of our army of good lawyers from across Canada have the specialized expertise to answer those questions for you. And uh, our team and our app will do everything we can to make sure you land with the right professional. Some introductions. I'm uh, thrilled to have my co-host back today, although not in person, but uh, that is the nature of, uh, you know, scrambling the morning after a big snowstorm. So Pauline, Welcome back. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm so excited to be back, Josh. I've missed everybody. Um, well, my name is Pauline. Uh, I am a practicing lawyer on the Good Lawyer platform, and I'm also an entrepreneur, and I'm also a lawyer in residence for Good Lawyers. So I've worked a lot with small businesses. I've had the big firm experience, uh, just like Josh has, and I think it wasn't until I discovered working with small businesses through Good Lawyer that I realized I actually do like practicing law. I'm excited to be able to help pass on some legal information for fellow entrepreneurs out there. Yeah, fantastic. So Pauline, you're going to bring a great dynamic to today's conversation because you have a uh, really unique ability to wear two hats in this conversation. Uh, you've got the legal experience, as you say, both in the big law world and serving the startup founders and entrepreneurs that are a part of the Good Lawyer Network, but also you're an entrepreneur yourself. So a lot of these um, kind of practical tips and lessons and guidance that we're going to share in terms of making good contracts, uh, you've lived them from both sides. Myself, uh, you know, if you're coming out to the Good Hour, you guys know me by now. My name is Josh. I'm the Chief Legal Officer at Good Lawyer. Uh, I am a corporate lawyer by training and by experience. So I've worked in the big law world for over six years, helping uh, clients, entrepreneurs, founders build and grow their business, uh, you know, enter into commercial agreements, buy and sell businesses, raise capital. So I'm bringing that experience to today's conversation. And really what I'm gonna to try to do is share a bit of a process and some tips that I developed while working in um, that sort of big law capacity, um, share some of those experiences with Pauline to draw out uh, your great subject matter expertise, Pauline. So always in the good hour, we wanna set the stage for our conversation. Uh, the challenge today is really talking about uh, making good contracts in your business. And, uh, you know, the idea and what we're trying to get to is ultimately helping you make better deals as the entrepreneur. Um, really good deals are deals where both parties to that uh, arrangement win and grow their business as a result. Uh, we want to share some uh, practical tips and lessons that we've learned in order to help you make better deals, like I said, but also to do it uh, more efficiently, uh, both from a cost and timing perspective, 
and also limit your risk as you enter into uh, some of these important agreements in your, uh, in your business practice. So here's the roadmap, basically. Uh, what we're gonna talk about really is uh, identifying some of the key issues that go along with entering into a commercial relationship, making a business deal. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what a process for making good commercial deals looks like in your business and certainly uh, encourage the entrepreneurs out there to put your own flavor and your own spin on it. But really uh, working with the process is going to help really structure how you enter into commercial deals and ensure that um, you are doing it efficiently, limiting your downside risk and ultimately negotiating better deals. And then finally, we're gonna conclude our conversation uh, really talking about some practical negotiation strategies that both myself and Pauline have, uh, have action in our experience, both on the entrepreneurial and in the um, you know, practicing lawyer side of things to help create more value. Okay, let's dive into things. So Pauline, you've got a new customer um, and they've come to you, they said, hey, Pauline, I need help uh, draft this commercial agreement for me. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the questions and some of that process that you dive into with a new customer uh, before you just start getting, uh, I'm gonna say get the pen out, but obviously you're right. <laughs> you know, getting that keyboard uh, heated up. What does that initial conversation look like? And what are you trying to draw out of the customer in order to really set the stage for, for drafting a good agreement? Um, yeah, so I mean, really everything on this slide that we have here is basically the, the starting questions that I want to understand. Um, what's the deal is, it's kind of funny, this one always, it's always kind of surprising, I think, with a client or, or say a sales um, a sales employee at a company that I deal with. I'm, I'm I ask them what the deal, and they're like, "Well, it's simple, you know. It's these three things, and you know, we're buying and selling this, and you know, this is the price, and that's it." So, usually, I find that there's I have a lot more questions um, than than maybe my clients are prepared to answer, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's actually part of the process is that I'm here to sort of help fill out all those details that maybe didn't necessarily get get talked about or maybe they did and, and the person has forgotten or whatever it might be but there's a lot of information that I'm going to want before I could actually even put like as you said heat up the keyboard or put pen to paper um, what's the deal like you said what does this mean for the business is this something we care about is this something we don't really care about if it goes sideways I mean Obviously, you care about it, but there's always going to be, you know, a weight to it. Is this something that we absolutely need to sign no matter what? If that's the case, I know what the bargaining powers are here. We need that deal. So we have a little bit less of a, a position to bargain from. Whereas on the other side, well, you know, there's other, other customers and this one is one we'd like to bring on board, but, you know, we're not really that fussed because so far they seem a little bit difficult to deal with. Again, speaks to bargaining power for me. So then I understand, okay, these are the things maybe that we will push back harder on. And these are the things that maybe we won't because we really want this client or the opposite if we really are kind of lukewarm about the situation. Yeah. So to me, all of these questions help you as the legal counsel. Um, as you say, you're, you're fleshing out kind of this significance of the deal for the client and the customer. And that's going to help you make a determination of how much rigor should actually go into the drafting process and yeah. uh, you know how how strongly do we need to negotiate is this you know one of a number of routine deals that we do all the time or is this sort of mission critical and you know mm -hmm. we absolutely have to you know be worried about xyz and trying to leverage the most value possible out of it so yeah. really important for legal counsel but also really really important as you know, the business owner, the entrepreneur, the startup founder, to ask yourself some of these questions as you go through the process, because, um, you know, you might think, well, absolutely, we got to get this papered, we got to get this locked down, I've been coming out to good lawyer webinars, and I know that it's important to get contracts in writing and have really robust and strong ones. Um, but as you start fleshing through this, you realize, oh, this actually um, should be more of a routine recurring type of business deal that we're going to have in our in our business and really um, you know it warrants a, a special approach 
based on those considerations. All right, um, let's dive into the process. We've sort of set the stage here and encouraged, you know, uh, really there is uh, some onus here on the entrepreneur and the startup founder to spend some time thinking about what those key issues are. And, you know, I think that's one thing that's uh, really strong about the Good Lawyer Network and, and the contract specialists that we have that make up our talent pool is that I think they are really good at drawing those, uh, that at drawing some of this information out of our customers, out of our clients to ask them some of these questions and ultimately set themselves up to create the best agreement, the best deal possible in those circumstances. So let's talk a little bit about the process. And you and I have uh, have been through this uh, before, Pauline. You know, in the webinar context and and going through the process. And I was really pleased to see that although we've never practiced law together, that we were pretty aligned on how we would approach um, you know drafting a, a new commercial agreement from scratch. So. For me, the first starting place of any uh, good business deal is really clearly identifying and documenting and uh, drawing out the operational terms of the deal. So who are the parties? You know, is it, uh, you know, Josh, the individual, or is it, you know, Josh Co, the business that's entering into the deal? Really clear, really important to be clear on that. Um, and then what is actually the substance of what we're doing here? Are we providing a yeah. service? Are we selling goods? And how does the, how do the pieces all fit together? Um, Pauline, anything else uh, that you've sort of experienced that, uh, you know, from an operational terms perspective, that maybe first time entrepreneurs, or maybe even your own experience that um, you sometimes miss or don't think of in terms of part of being the operational substance of what you want to flesh out? Um, I would say one of the sort of more common ones that I run into, I feel like they're, it's, it's about pricing and or say payment. Payment is a big one, I find. Um, people generally, uh, teams that I've worked with generally sort of, okay, yeah, yeah, that's good. Or they're not worried about it. Or maybe they haven't even read it, to be honest. Um, but that's one that I think comes with some really significant um, potential consequences. So you don't pay your bills. Um, maybe you're just late. Maybe you just forgot this month. You know, maybe it's a manual process and somebody is sick and so it hasn't been done. It unfortunately, there's always clauses in the contract that we'll talk about. For example, if you don't, if you don't pay on time, we you can charge interest. That's sort of the least of the issues, to be honest. I mean, in some ways, it's significant if you don't have money for that. It's it's money that you don't need to be paying. But the other issue, really, to me, is that people can terminate contracts because you haven't paid them, and that termination clause might say something to the effect of, "If you don't pay, we just terminate right away." Or maybe they give you notice, or maybe they don't. But it to me that leads down the road where potentially maybe somebody doesn't want to, the other party doesn't want to be dealing with you anymore. And so this is a perfect way for them to get out of the contract without, without any, any problems on their part. And they can just say, see you later. And it's a small payment issue that could have been fixed if they had just simply told you. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe it would lead to a bigger discussion for you about what is happening with say the customer that, you know, things are going well, but let's talk about it and we can fix this. And then they don't terminate the contract. But unfortunately, that little tiny piece about payment can often lead to bigger consequences that I think not everybody always thinks about. It seems very simple. Seems like, yeah, yeah, I'll always pay on time. But you always want to account for the what, what ifs, right? Yeah, yeah, super important. So um, let's uh, bookmark that we're going to go a little bit deeper on payment terms but i have one that came to to my mind as i was asking you that question um and you know i'll share a little bit of the story from the good lawyer context so one thing that i've seen uh, a bunch of times here in good lawyer is really in the context of uh call it a, a lot of different names you know partner marketing referral affiliate type agreement so you know notionally the deal terms are well you're going to market us and we're going to market you to our customers and together there's going to be some benefit there. And, you know, maybe there's some exchange of consideration. You know, if we get a new customer, we'll pay you X. If you get a new customer, you pay us Y. Um, but the key piece from the operational piece that I always uh, see missing, and I, I've got to go back to um, either the 
counterparty or our own sort of marketing team here is to say, okay, what are we actually doing? Yeah, we're, we're co-branding, we're, we're marketing. Does that mean uh, a web page? Does that mean emails? Does that mean they've got to do social media posts? Does that mean we need a little button that lands on our affiliates um, website? We're on their partner page. So to me, really important to you know, work with the stakeholders in our business and, you know, same to the, the entrepreneurs that are part of the conversation today, you know, one of your sales people bring you an affiliate deal. Okay. What does this actually mean? And how do you get the most value for, you know, each party out of this and, and really getting down to that detail of, you know, email sequences, web pages, uh, referral codes, whatever it may be really, really important from that operational perspective. Yeah, for sure. Who does what and what do you get? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's jump into the deeper piece on payment because you, you raised a number of really great and important um, issues in the context of payment. Really, this is, for me, the most important piece uh, of any contract. Once we've determined what we're doing, we've got to know the payment piece. How does money flow? And I was really careful in the way that I uh, chose my language here for, for the slide on you know, the point on number two, test the payment mechanics. And for me, this was always my practice when I was uh, working with customers, whether in the context of buying and selling a business or entering into a new commercial relationship, you know, I would get the pen and paper out and I would plug numbers in you know, and test the, the payment formula that the contract describes. And if it, I couldn't figure it out by writing out in pen and paper, then that was a huge, huge red flag. And honestly, I'm uh, um, you know, really ashamed to say the number of times that uh, you know, our profession would uh, create contracts where you couldn't really clearly understand how the money flowed, what the payment terms were, what the total financial obligation of the deal was. So the concrete example that I can give and the most confusing one I've ever seen um, and curious your experience with this, Pauline, because I know you've, uh, you've had commercial leases before, but it was a commercial lease. So the rent, the op costs, and uh, you know, some other ancillary pieces of um, uh, payment that was due to the landlord, really, really convoluted and difficult to uh, calculate. And for me, that was uh, essentially a red flag to say to my client in that circumstance, I would not enter into this lease. I keep looking for different space because this is a total mess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't. I actually, for specifically for the lease situation that I've I've dealt with personally as an entrepreneur, there, it was actually it was already sort of um, it worked out well for us in that case. We were taking over a lease, and so it sort of just was going to flow continuously the way it always had. But um, I, I, one of my clients that I've worked with, they have a um, much well it's a much it's a really big organization and essentially what it amounts to is every single time I review contracts for them the the sales team it never looks at this for sure but but I in my mind I just know that the organization is slow at paying their bills they're slow it's often overdue um, and this is just the way they I, I don't know if it's the way they do business but it's just the way this has always been the case with them and so every single time it comes up in the contract I flag it for for the sales team because this is I have watched this in practice I have watched this not work we have had customers come back and say we're you know we, or we've had sorry vendors come back and say we're not providing any more services, goods, whatever it might be, until you guys pay our bills. And that's, to be honest, that's a, I mean, that's just them doing business and coming to us and saying, you're not paying us. But again, like I said, this is the problem is then at some point, they will simply say, okay, that's it. We're not working with you guys anymore. This is not happening because you never pay your bills. So we're going to terminate the contract. Or as I said, use the the non-payment as sort of the way out of the contract because they maybe didn't otherwise want to be working with us. And the payment is just one of the issues. And the fact is they, we, I have seen also with this, with this client that there's a lot of, they pay interest. They have no problem paying interest and they just continue to pay interest. So 
it's important to have, I always tell my clients that it's important to have that in the contract so that you can use it as a way to help speed up payment if you mm. need to. But also you are really, truly, if it's always taking forever to get paid, you're entitled to some kind of some kind of compensation for that, right? And whether from a business perspective, you actually go to your vendor and say, hey, you, you know, we're going to start charging interest or your customers, sorry, you're going to start charging interest. That's one thing. It says that in the contract and you can do it, but it doesn't mean you have to. There might be some sort of business reason where you don't want to do that and that's fine, but it's important to have it in there because yeah. it's, it's sort of your, it's like I've said before, it's your backstop. You can rely on it if you need to. Yeah, that's a that's a really great practical tip as a backstop and sort of to de-risk that case of late payment or non-payment. And as you say, you don't have to enforce it if there's a business reason for maintaining some sort of goodwill and giving some, you know, call it interest forgiveness or something like that in the context. But if you don't have the provision, really hard to now say, oh yeah, you're you're 30 days late, you owe us an extra, you know, X percent. Um, yeah. So, yeah, important to think of that uh, ahead of time. Another kind of practical solution that I've used in the past, and I'm curious how many of uh, your customers you see do this. I think it does uh, depend maybe on the overall uh, financial commercial value of the agreement. Um, but I like to include a, an example of how the money flows. So let's say you know the, the total obligation, we sell X number of widgets, uh, and then our customer owes us you know, $10,000 per month, and here's how the formula flows. And it's an Excel sheet, or it's an illustration that you basically staple onto the agreement, which, you know, gives everybody some comfort. If we do this much business, this is how the, the formula works. This is how much you owe us at the end of the month. And if you're late, this is the, you know, the late fees or the interest that apply. So I do really like uh, the inclusion of some sort of schedule or example of actually um, illustrating the payment mechanics in in practice. Yeah, for sure. I um, some I mean, in some cases, obviously, it's not necessary. It's fairly simple, and people, you know, it's it's understood. But then I have seen some very complicated um, payment situations. There's a lot of if this, then payment is this. If that, then payment is that. And and that's just two of the two of the possible branches of how you get paid and what you get paid. And so I agree. I think the exam having an example is really good. I do also then always make sure there's language in there that is very specific. This is just an example. There are no guarantees that this is what might be, this is going to happen or all that sort of, and that's sort of where I think having a lawyer comes in handy. This is like, this is important language to include to say that this is just an example. Yeah. So the next step in the process here, and this is, you know, something that I've picked up and heard from you in the past, Pauline, is, you know, really the, the substance of a contract is allocating risk among or between the parties to that contract. Um, so let's just talk briefly about some of the mechanisms that we as lawyers understand and build into a contract as part of that risk allocation. Um, the first one that I will hit on is uh, sort of the reps and warranties and maybe you take take over from there, but reps and warranties are for me an important piece for high dollar value type contracts where you want to essentially um, solidify the assumptions and the basis upon which you're entering into a contract with the other party. So I'm gonna enter into a contract with Pauline on the assumption that Pauline is an established business, on the assumption that Pauline is not being sued by anybody, on the assumption that Pauline's not a major credit risk, that she does have the funds able to pay me, on the assumption that Pauline has uh, complied with um, environmental laws or marketing laws, on the assumption that my decision to do business with Pauline is not going to um, hurt my brand or my goodwill in the open marketplace. So I look for a number of representations from Pauline to help um, solidify those assumptions and those um, key pieces that I'm taking into account when I make the decision to do a deal with her. And by codifying those and setting those out clearly in the agreement, if any one of those assumptions turn out to be inaccurate or wrong, we would call it a breach or a, of a rep or warranty. And then I'm entitled to collect damages from Pauline as a result of you, you misrepresented to me, you knew that this assumption I was making 
was wrong and you told me otherwise, and I've suffered a loss as a result of that. So that's one way of allocating risk, setting out the assumptions that each of the parties are making and coming to uh, an important agreement and business decision. Uh, yeah, so I, yeah, allocating risk, really the rest of the, the, the points here on the slides, indemnification, limitations of liability and insurance coverage. These ones are, I find that the vast majority of my time negotiating contracts are spent on these provisions. They're very, and it's because they're important to get right. So really what you're doing is preparing for, okay, if something goes wrong, which we hope it doesn't, but if something goes wrong, who's going to be responsible for what? And then if you're responsible for only a certain amount, then that means I guess I am responsible for the rest of it and vice versa. So where, whether or not, like what, what those, what the responsibility ends up being and how you allocate that between you and your customer or you and your, your vendors, it's, it really just depends on what it is that you're offering for products and services. So if you offer a certain service, which you really have no idea if, you know, you're, you're just offering, say, suggestions for people to do a certain thing rather than advice, actual advice, than actual professional advice. In that case, you might be able to say that, okay, well, we're not responsible for anything um, in the warranty, at least, that we, this is on an as-is basis and we're, we're not, basically, we're not backing this service. We're just passing it through to you. In that case, your limitation of liability might be, might be something really, really low, maybe 10% of the you know, value of the contract or something like that, because you basically have no, you're saying that we don't offer you any sort of guarantee that this is good service. However, we will provide the service and we will give you this much of, of um, liability response. We'll take this much responsibility if something goes wrong. And there's that, that does happen and that can happen, but it's not always, it'll really depend on what kind of say goods and services you're offering and where, I guess, depending on where you are in the offering. So for example, if you're manufacturing a widget that you sell to someone who distributes a bunch of widgets and then that distributor then sells different types of widgets, including yours to different end users and, and customers, then there's going to, you're going to want something different for limitation of liability because you don't have any, any visibility, I guess, as to what happens beyond the distributor. You give your, you sell the product to the distributor and then you think you're done, but then that product goes to an end user who runs into trouble with it. They're going to come back to the distributor and say, well, you know, you should be liable for what happened with my machine because your widget broke my machine. Well, that's not the distributor's widget. That's your widget. So the distributor is going to come back to you. So if you're going to take on a certain amount of liability, what is that liability? And if you're going to take that liability on what else can you do in your contract that will help protect you from something happening with the end user, should the end user come back to the distributor, who then comes back to you? Yeah. And then the last thing I would say is the insurance coverage is also, that's pretty important as well. Depending on where you are, for example, in my example just now, depending on where you are in that chain, are you the manufacturer? Are you the distributor? You may be able to only get certain types of coverage for your activities, for your business activities. So if you're the manufacturer, you get a certain type of coverage. If you're the distributor, you get a certain type of coverage. That insurance coverage may or may not line up with what you've agreed to be liable for under the contract. So you want somebody to be able to look at this and think about, okay, is this matching or is there a little bit of a gap? How big is that gap? Am I willing to be responsible for that gap? Yeah. So something that hits me on insurance, there's kind of two pieces to that. There's, you know, your own insurance as a business owner, so that if something goes wrong in that commercial relationship, you're not bankrupting your company for the liability exposure that you have. That's why uh, you've engaged an insurance provider, the insurance provider steps in and, and covers that claim on your behalf, but also as a mechanism of de-risking um, a mistake or a breach that your counterparty can have. You know, you might insist, you know, if I'm doing business with Pauline, I might insist, Pauline, I need you to have at least $2 million in liability coverage, you know, general um, commercial liability coverage, because your business is pretty new. I know you don't have $2 million in the bank. Uh, I don't want to bankrupt you. I, you know, I'd like to keep doing business with you, but if something goes wrong here, the exposure for me is pretty large, and I need to know that, you know, I can be properly compensated, and your new business is not going to be able to make me whole. So 
the only way I enter into this agreement with you is if you, you know, you do show me that you have that insurance coverage in place. Yeah, definitely. All right, so this is an important one, and we talk about this in a couple of different contexts, but we talk about it today in the kind of broader uh, commercial relationship working with um, vendors, third parties, service providers. We also talk about this in the context of working with contractors and employees, protecting your important assets. The most critical one that I want to communicate today is um, wrapping uh, some contractual language around the ownership of the intellectual property that is involved in this commercial deal. So if I'm sharing um, you know, confidential information with Pauline so that Pauline can either uh, deliver a widget or provide a service to my business, a couple of things. First, I wanna make sure that I still retain ownership over anything that I share with Pauline. I want to make sure that I have strong confidentiality provisions that protect um, the confidentiality of the information I share with Pauline, um, and also that I limit uh, Pauline's ability to use that information to the you know, squarely defined limited use case and purposes of delivering the service or delivering the value for which we're contracting. The final piece that we need to talk about is who actually owns the output of this commercial agreement. Um, you know, it might be really, really, really important from my business and my perspective that if I'm engaging Pauline's business to help um, in a certain way, that whatever output is created from that relationship is owned by my business and I can continue to use it without having to pay Pauline on an ongoing basis. There are certainly, you know, other circumstances where maybe Pauline should be the owner and then I continue to license it from her on an ongoing basis. But really thinking, um, you know, thoughtfully and clearly about protecting that important value, the work product that we're creating together, and the confidential and proprietary, you know, intellectual property and confidential information that are the inputs flowing in, really, really critical stage of this contract making process. Yeah, um, I, this is one, I mean, it's, it's, Lots of things are important, but this one is particularly important to get right at the beginning before you get working together, doing business together, selling things, making things, creating things, whatever it might be. It's um, this is I think always the example of you know if you're if things go great that's wonderful, but if they don't, um, at the point when things the relationship is breaking down, how are who's going to be saying oh you know what. I'm feeling charitable. Here, why don't you have it? You can own this asset. I don't need it. I'll go create something else. That's not going to happen. So at that moment, you are fighting over something where there's no paper to back you. There's no language. There's no, there's no contract to say, okay, you know what? This is what we decided at the very beginning. You keep this. I keep this. You get to use it this way. I get to use it this way. It's so important to get this right at the very beginning before you start. Yeah, totally. One, one, you know, practically, I see this uh, overlooked lots of times by customers because the feeling is, oh, well, it's obvious. Obviously, I own it. And you're sitting in your chair saying, yeah, it's obvious. Obviously, we own it. And, uh, you know, we don't have the conversation because, you know, it, it is so obvious to each of us that it should go that way. But absolutely, you've got to dig in. You've got to think about this in a rigorous way and certainly have the conversation. And, you know, as I described, there are certain commercial contexts where, you know, the service provider likely should own uh, some of the intellectual property or, or process or whatever it is created in the context of our commercial relationship. And there are other pieces, especially if I'm paying, you know, significant, significant dollar value um, that I should be the owner of the outcome. And I do not want, you know, Pauline, for example, taking the learnings and the value that that she developed in building a particular widget or helping with an outcome for my business and then selling that to one of my competitors. So an important, important conversation to have. Yeah, I would actually add to the on the confidential information piece that is, I mean, depending on what it is that you're doing, if you're, you know, getting into a partnership, potentially going to work with a, a customer who's going to be buying, you know, the vast majority of what you're providing or something like that, those, it's that important that 
often you'll be signing an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement at the beginning. And it may, it's, I would often say that there, I see a lot of mutual ones that basically we're exchanging information to decide if we're even going to get into a relationship. And if we're exchanging that kind of information, we need to have a specific agreement just to cover that exchange of it, that initial exchange of information. And it doesn't even mean that you have to get into the actual agreement and actually sell or work with each other or whatever the case may be. It's just, it is that important to protect your assets that you sometimes will be signing these agreements, even if you don't know if there will be a relationship at the end of it. It's just purely so that you can look at each other's products and services or what you can do for each other and get really deep in to figure out if you are going to work together. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, it, you raise a great point there. And I think oftentimes entrepreneurs think, oh, NDA, that's, uh, you know, super simple. Let's just download yeah. one off the internet and get it going. And, um, you know, in some cases, I think that is a fair assumption. But for the important ones, um, and as you described, the circumstances where you want to use an NDA typically are. Uh, a big, important, robust, potential uh, commercial relationship, having the right NDN, and NDA non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement in place that allows you to negotiate and explore um, a deal opportunity, a relationship opportunity together with that counterparty. Um, it's really important. And if you don't have you know, the right sort of mutual language or um, for me, I think one that is often missed in the templates and often not recognized by entrepreneurs is it's not just about confidentiality. You can't go out and tell other people about this, but it's about limiting the use. So if I don't have the use limitation, I've shared all my information with Pauline. Yeah, you got to keep it confidential. And she's saying, yeah, sure. I can keep this confidential and also reverse engineer all of this and now go and compete with you because I haven't limited the use. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've got to be really careful, uh, as you described, a, a complex, potentially high value, exploratory type um, commercial relationship is the type that typically warrants an NDA. And if it's that sort of important relationship, I would say that it also warrants getting the right NDA and getting some professional legal advice to make sure that you're covered. Uh, let's just talk very quickly the importance of, you know, as you described, uh, planning for some bad outcomes when you enter into uh, contractual relationships. And so an important feature of every agreement is looking at how do we get out of this thing? What happens if we sort of the relationship sort of breaks down or it's not working the way that we were hoping to? Um, is there, you know, an escalation type of procedure? We start with another round of negotiations, maybe among um, you know, the salespeople that are directly involved in, in activating the agreement. And then, you know, maybe we have to escalate it to our respective uh, key leadership teams. From there, do we work with a mediator or do we go, you know, forget all of that stuff. Let's go straight to the courthouse and fight this thing out. Um, certainly having that thought process and building some mechanism into your contract is really important because if you leave that blank and you do have a deterioration in the relationship, um, ambiguity can be really costly. You know, we're, we're left in this vacuum and now we're, we're left fighting over how should we fight about this agreement? And that is, I mean, talk about uh, inefficiencies and spinning your wheels and, and, and just really lighting money on fire from a, you know, legal perspective. Yeah, for sure. Um, I find often the timelines for these are, are really important. It's kind of like you were talking about with, um, you know, escalation of disputes. So yeah, you know, things aren't, something's gone wrong. There's a problem. How, you know, your the sales team maybe is discussing with their counterpart on the other side, trying to figure out how to fix the problem. And, you know, it's three months later and nothing has been fixed. And now, you know, both parties are angry. And again, like you said, here we are starting the process of lighting money on fire. But instead, you know, if you have those specific timelines that are talking about, okay, you got another 10 days, within 10 days, you're going to negotiate amongst, you know, these two. And then if that doesn't work, we're going to escalate it to, you know, another 20 days worth of negotiations for the leadership team. And then if that doesn't work, then what the next steps are mediation, arbitration, courthouse, whatever it might be. It's the same thing with termination. 
what, how, how, you know, how many days notice are you going to give me to terminate if you just decide out of nowhere that you just don't really like me all of a sudden and you don't want to work with me? Are you able to terminate that contract immediately, which leaves me in a lurch because I've been working really hard producing these products for you and the contract is over just like that because you sent me an email or do you need to give me 30 days or if something's going wrong. Maybe you need to give me 30 days to try and fix the problem. And if I can't fix the problem, okay, contract is terminated. Yeah. Yeah. So last piece here, I just want to hit on this really quickly is this idea of staying diligent, you know, the importance of, you know, actually working through this process, start to finish and not ignoring, you know, some of the, as we describe it, the boilerplate, the defined terms, the schedules, the exhibits, those all uh, are really important to kind of putting substance into your agreement. Um, those are the important terms by which um, you know, a defined term can have uh, a big uh, interpretive effect on the overall kind of story that that contract is trying to tell. So as the entrepreneur, you've got to stay diligent working through it. Your lawyer will certainly stay diligent top to bottom working through things like the defined terms and the boilerplate. And the last piece and the mo most important one here that I want to leave you with is you've got to actually get these things signed. Nothing worse than going through the whole process of negotiating and talking about the agreement and pulling together the commercial terms. You've tested the payment mechanics, you've allocated risk, and then you never actually got the document signed. You start working on this contractual relationship as if it exists and it, it hasn't been executed. And now we have a problem down the road and nobody can find the signed contract. And again, now we're left fighting over um, this ambiguity you know, do we even have a contract in place? And I want to enforce it. And you're saying, well, we don't have a contract. We've just been doing this on, you know, based on these email terms that we exchanged and yeah. we're in a whole, whole fight, a whole issue. Yeah. I actually also see a lot of um, uh, contracts that are signed by, for example, maybe a company, and, but it's signed, it's not signed in the name of the company. It's just signed in the person's own name as an individual or, whatever some company that doesn't actually exist but presents as a company so i again the signature piece is actually quite important and it's often overlooked i find because it seems well it's just a signature it's a line i know how to do this i've done it a million times it's true but somebody needs to look at that real quick and just make sure that you're getting the protection you should be getting totally all right well what i want to do here is just highlight three fantastic lawyers that are you know very much what i would describe as the corporate commercial and, and contract drafting making negotiating type specialists that are a part of the good lawyer network i've hit on just three here that i want to highlight um, these are the type of experienced professionals uh, that have the specialized nuanced talent to serve you across the good lawyer network across canada and what i've tried to highlight here is um, a couple of important things that I think um, make a really great lawyer for a particular circumstance. So certainly the corporate commercial experience, as I've described, you know, the experience, uh, obviously, that uh, Pauline has shared with you in, in, you know, the types of businesses and contracts that she's familiar with. But also, I think an important one and something that we do a really good job at Good Lawyer of trying to manage for you is matching you with the right industry experience. So your business is in uh, technology or in consumer packaged goods or in um, fashion or construction or some other unique industry, getting the commercial expertise married and tied in with a lawyer that has worked in your industry, I think is going to really deliver great results and great agreements for your business. Pauline, let's talk uh, quickly here in our remaining time. I think we've got about 15 minutes or so, some of our practical negotiation strategies here. So why don't I open the floor to you, pick one that you want to hit on here and, and describe for our audience here, how you might approach this and employ it uh, in practice, whether you're working with another business owner or another lawyer on a commercial deal. Uh, I'm going to pick the first one. Um, everything is open for negotiation. Uh, that is to me, I always it always comes back to what is the worst that could possibly happen if you ask for something? The other side will say no. Okay, that's fine. But as long as you know that they may they may say no, then that's fine. Um, I actually am always when my clients when I 
when I negotiate a contract and I put in all the changes that I would like to see, for example, in the contract, my client takes it to the other party. When it comes back with no changes at all, I'm always a little, it throws me off. I'm just like, what? What's happening here? Did they actually look at it? So I'm always expecting to see something being negotiated, whether it's a legal term or whether it's a business term. Um, But I mean, honestly, and and honestly, when those contracts come back and there's no changes, I'm like, great, that's wonderful for my client. I was prepared to negotiate. And to be honest, there are things that I see in contracts that I'll think that's not really reasonable for us to be asking for, but whatever, we're just going to throw it over to the other side and we'll see what happens. And if they don't negotiate it, that's great. That's a good deal for my client. And I'm not going to put it out there that we're going to change it up front and ahead for you. But so in my experience, I'm shocked when I don't see things come back with with at least one change. So to me, that what that says is negotiate it. There's nothing wrong with it. Put, figure out the order of the things that you want to negotiate that you care about. High priority, medium priority, low priority. Be willing to give up some of those things to get some other things. But negotiate it. What's wrong with it? There's no harm with asking and them saying no. Okay, so that's such a great point. And I love the way you illustrated it for the audience because I think this is an important nuance that, um, you know, many entrepreneurs, startup founders, business owners might not recognize because a lot of your negotiation happens face-to-face, person-to-person, you're having the conversation and, uh, you know, certainly in, in media and movies, pop culture and the like, w- negotiations are always sort of reflected and represented as, you know, these boardroom style conversation. And in reality, a lot of the detail in getting to great commercial agreements and negotiating those to a final piece actually happens in writing. As you just described, you've marked up an agreement and you've changed a clause here or there and you've uh, expanded the the liability cap for one party, you've made another clause mutual, uh, you've uh, worked with a definition to make it more favorable to your to your client, it still fits within the broad, broadly negotiated deal terms that your client has brought to you uh, but you've made nuanced tweaks to make it, um, you know, favorable to allocate risk, as we've discussed. And so a lot of, as you say, that detail is happening actually in the writing. And yeah, a great reflection. You know, you ask for it by putting it in writing. And if it comes back with no changes, you know, you've just uh, materially improved your customer's position in the detail of that agreement. So that's, um, you know, such an important way of reflecting the reality of how a lot of this stuff happens in yeah. the week. Um, one that I want to hit on, uh, number four, this is something that I really developed and came by honestly in the context of, uh, you know, my prior experience working in a law firm. And I remember being a very junior lawyer. And I learned this the hard way with a partner that I was preparing an agreement for. And, you know, I had included some precedent language in a, you know, what I thought was a pretty complex agreement at the time that had some international uh, type of flavor and exposure to it. And he came and said to me, you know, what does this particular clause mean? Help me understand what you're trying to achieve with, you know, clause 10 or whatever it may be. And I couldn't, my answer was, well, you know, it, it was in the precedence that I looked like that I looked at and it was just in there. And uh, I said, well, you know, we can't defend that. So if you can't explain to me and help me understand why you you know, you've included a particular provision and why it's important to our customer, um, you know, we've got to strike it. So either go and figure it out or let's take it out of the agreement. And so I learned that and was very embarrassed with, you know, the partner that I was working with, but I then started employing that in the context of, you know, negotiating with another lawyer like Pauline, for example. Okay, well, you've got a strong, um, call it indemnification provision or, you know, uh, uh, some reps and warranties in there or some certain covenants. Help me understand what this clause means to you. You know, what is it? What are you trying to achieve with this? I, I don't get it. And, it, you know, it's a, you know, maybe showing a little bit of, uh, you know, vulnerability or, or uh, whatever as, as the professional in the room. But in a lot of cases, if that that same principle applies. If the other lawyer or the other business owner can't substantiate it, well, we need it because X, Y, Z, then it becomes a really easy one to say, well, let's just strike it, take it out of the agreement and move on. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I personally, you're right. It makes it feels a little vulnerable, but I'm not going to lie in my mind when that happens. I, but I always think to myself, well, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. And you couched it as if you are vulnerable, but really you pushed me to the point where I'm now like, oh, I'm not really sure why this is in here. I guess we don't really need it. And then I, if I can't explain it, like you said, then I guess it's really not that important to me to change it. Yeah. Um, hit on another one for us here, Pauline. Um, I would say know when to walk is also um, is a good one. I mean, I've had clients for sure that we've spent a lot of time um, negotiating and working on a contract that's been back and forth, you know, hours and hours of time spent trying to get to the, get to a deal. And then at the end of the day, uh, my client comes back to me with the next draft and says, you know, they really are not willing to work with us on these things, which between myself and my client, we've decided that those are really important things that they, they want to have in the contract, no matter what. And then the client says, you know what, they're not working with us on this. And actually through this negotiation process, I've come to realize that if this is the way that they work with their, their, their vendors, partners, whatever it is, I don't want to work with them because this is not, it's already like this. It's not going to get better after the contract is signed. So, and these clients have then walked away from the deal, even though they have spent a lot of money trying to get this together in the first place, legal advice and all the other things that they've been doing, even so, so far as to changing the, the corporate structure and all of these things. But at the end of the day, it was just like, you know what, this doesn't feel right. The negotiations have actually, it's not just hard negotiation. There's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, just uh, not not great business behavior, I would say. And so the client said, you know what, that's it. We don't need to do this anymore. I will find another another partner, vendor, whatever it might be. And I think that's really important. You do not have to get into that contract. And sometimes if you do it against all of those feelings that are kind of coming up, like, oh, I don't know about this, it may cause you more trouble in the end. Yeah. Okay. So that's such a great story. And it hits on a couple of pieces for me. I mean, for one, um, an important thing to have in your back in the back of your mind and actually gives you a tremendous amount of um, call it leverage and confidence going into negotiating a, a contractual and business relationship is knowing um, what is the point where you're better off not making the deal or you're better off going to find a different party to make the deal. Um, so you need to know sort of your, your walk away point, your um, in the kind of literature around negotiations, if you know you are in law school and you're going through the textbook, your best alternative to a negotiated solution. Understanding that walk away point gives you a ton of leverage and clarity in, in having those conversations. But what you shared with us, Pauline, also touches to me on this point of maintaining integrity. So yeah, maybe the deal is still better than an alternative to a negotiated solution, but the process of getting there uh, one party or the other really sort of compromise their integrity. There's not a good, you know, there's not a lot of goodwill between us anymore. The relationship is sort of souring and, and you've, you know, reflected, I think, really well that um, this is not maybe the best way where we want to start off a commercial relationship that could last for years if we're having such a hard time, you know, getting an agreement signed in the first place. So, you know, I, I think that's an important piece. Um, I'll just expand a little bit on the maintain integrity and then we'll we'll move ahead to sort of uh, share our offer with our audience and, and hit some questions, although I haven't seen any in the Q&A tab. So this is your, your final call to pick Pauline's brain, to pick my brain with questions. The integrity piece, um, we're all, you know, entrepreneurs and business owners because we want to be in it for the long haul. It's not a quick uh, sort of one and done and so your reputation and the way that you interact with your customers, your suppliers, your business counterparties uh, will be material to your long-term success. So compromising your integrity for a quick win on a deal, um, you know, I have to think will ultimately catch up with you. We certainly saw that in um, you know, the legal space. And, and Pauline, I'm sure you remember the law school days you know, from you know, the idea of maintaining your integrity as a professional hugely, hugely important. And I have to think it's it's identical um, in the business context. You've got to really guard that reputation and your integrity because we all want to be successful in the long term and, and uh, you know, compromising that for a short-term win 
Um, yeah. Certainly feels like to me uh, something that is not worth the trade-off and could ultimately hurt your business as it as it grows and evolves over the long-term horizon. Yeah. There's a saying here, I feel like, but you know, essentially it takes years and years to build that reputation. It takes no time at all. No time at all. One thing can happen and that reputation is gone. Yeah. Now that was uh, uh, first day of law school, I think, getting that drilled in. Yeah. <laughs> And ever since. All right. So mission accomplished. Uh, we talked about the importance of, you know, you as a business owner, identifying the key issues that go into making a deal um, with a counterparty uh, entering into a new business relationship. I think one that I bolt on there that we touched on at the end of our conversation is uh, really understanding what is your walk away point? What's a what's your best alternative to doing this deal with your counterparty? We went through a deal-making process and contract drafting process. Um, this is a, sort of the way that your lawyer and the professionals in our network um, think about approaching these uh, material and important business relationships, commercial relationships that you enter into um, as your business grows and evolves over time. And then finally, we spent some time talking about, you know, here are practical the negotiation strategies so you can create more value. And I think the last piece that I want to leave you with there is that, you know, great negotiators and great business deals are ones where all of the parties um, feel good about it. And that ultimately you've unlocked value and created a better deal for everybody, as opposed to this, you know, one-sided idea of, wow, well, I beat out Pauline or Pauline beat out me because, you know, um, you know, she's just a better negotiator. Ultimately, we want to create the best deal possible, and that's what really good uh, negotiation strategies do. That's what really good lawyers can help you uncover as you work with the counterparty, creating the best deal possible. Okay, so you've accepted the challenge, and you want to start using you know, robust, well-thought-out commercial contracts in your business. Um, there's really two ways that you can start doing this in your business today. One is the traditional law firm model. That means billable hours. So you call Pauline or myself in our, in our old jobs when we used to work in a traditional law firm and we start the clock and we talk with you and we ask you the questions and we go through the process. And at the end of the day, we send you a bill for thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, maybe even more money than the whole commercial contract was worth to your business in the first place. So, you know, really challenging as an early stage entrepreneur or startup founder to enter into those open-ended relationships to get your contracts drafted. The alternative is what we've built with Good Lawyer. Um, you know, we've brought together a network of lawyers from across Canada um, that work with us because they want to work with early stage entrepreneurs and business owners like you. You know, that's why Pauline became a good lawyer and why, you know, Pauline at the uh, start of the show here today expressed that you know she enjoys practicing law again because of customers clients like you guys we deliver all of our services on a fixed fee basis so that means if you need an employment contract uh, a master services agreement a contract with an independent uh, service provider customer contract whatever it may be you know the fixed price for that commercial deal before you purchase it before you get into the arrangement and that gives you the power to budget and plan around your legal spend and your commercial uh, operations. So as a thank you for the, you know, all the participants that hung out with us to the very end of our conversation today, what we wanna do is extend an offer for you, uh, $50 off for a legal strategy session. So what we're saying is, you know, thanks for spending time with us. Thanks for investing in you know, becoming a, uh, a smarter business owner, understanding the, how the legal aspects um, of commercial contract making can add value to your business. And the thank you is, you know, we want to connect you with one of the lawyers in our network for a 60 minute deep dive. And, you know, one way that you might think about using this time is to, you know, uh, bring together a suite of your most important contracts and think of some of the questions and issues that are keeping you up at night about those contracts and you might have a conversation with a professional like Pauline who can help you develop a strategy uh, to improve those contracts, to make them better as you deal with new parties um, in the future. I think that's all I got. 
we're at 11.03. Pauline, always a pleasure hanging out with you. Thank you uh, for joining me. Uh, great to have you back in the co-host chair. And for all of our entrepreneurs, thanks so much for joining us for the good hour. We will see you next time. Thanks, everyone.